started, I know that some people may still be showing up, but you know, that's fine for the we to keep our our schedule as best that we can. So who brought who he has brought and that's cool. So, um, when we had our first Islamophobia talk, um, was it December, September, December, and we were discussing uh, a response to Christianity, and I think that went quite well, and you know, I was happy, I walked away from that, um, that talk and that teaching session upbeat, because I don't usually do that when I ever leave one of my talks, I don't always leave upbeat. I'm very critical of my own uh, performance. And so I hope today Allah will give us um, healthy to um, make this successful. And obviously, everyone who has helped in creating the PowerPoint and the handouts and everything, Allah rewards you. And I don't need to mention you. Your, your acts are recorded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, I just did read, I just read some books and sent in some notes and they put everything together for me. And so, if there's a glitch with the PowerPoint, it's not my fault. So I absolved myself of that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, if afterwards you would, basically, you got a handout also. I believe that handout is made from the PowerPoint, so it should fall in sync. There are spaces there for um, filling in. Um, there are some questions that are asked. I think there's questions that are there to, to, to sort of you know, pose yourself. Why are you, are you, are you getting anything from this um, series of presentations today on the topics that we'll cover? And I initially, according to if you've seen the poster, the poster, um, there were certain things mentioned on the poster, for example, Ahadimma, for example, the people who are um, under a state, essentially the minority of, the yeah, discussion of minority non Muslims under a classical Islamic rule. Those um, points will not be discussed today because as I was preparing for this, I had to sort of shift in how I thought I wanted to present things. And um, those things, well, in the future, I would hope that we will discuss more of those points um, in greater detail. Um, in front of me, I have some books, some of the books that I was using. Um, this book by uh, Ibn Abdul Ibn Abdul is a very well-known Shafi medieval scholar on his Kawail Ahkam, the Masala Anam. It's a, a book that is a, a well-known and often cited text. In any discussion you might see in a, a list of cited texts on issues of Islamic legal theory, Makas um, al-Sharia, that is objectives of Islamic sacred law, and um, it's one of the Medieval text that this was that was the earliest ones that, that was actually penned on that point of, of discussion. Um, Dr. Um, Muhammad Hash, uh, Hashim uh, Kamali, uh, who is probably one of the foremost contemporary living Muslim scholars who writes um, tech books in issues of Islamic law and legal theory and issues of human rights, uh, issues of equality, liberty, these issues. Um, that are um, in the Islamic discussion. Um, the translation even assures uh, his Risalata uh, on his Risala on Maqas al Sharia is, is, is a good text. You can buy this text. You know, I, you know, I, any of the books I recommend to get, you know, Arabic, of course, get the Arabic text. And um, another book I, I use, this is this doctor by uh, Kamali. This is one on freedom, equality, and justice in the Sinus from the Rice University Library. Um, this one is a nice book. I actually did enjoy reading this one, Democracy and Islam. Democracy is one of these bugbear words for some Muslims if you're on Facebook, at least on my Facebook. And I, I seem to get a lot of people recently who are members of Hizbul Tahrir. And so I keep getting all these, um, especially from Australia. You know, there's a Hizbul Tahrir contingent in Australia, which I knew 
and they're always very active after all the Juma, especially in Auburn, always handing out flyers and stuff, and always having, you know, some type of protest or something going on, and always putting up postings on Facebook that are very, like, you know, like, juxtaposing democracy and Islam, as if democracy was this totally evil, satanic thing. And then, um, so that's uh, a really good book. It's actually from Rice. Um, actually, this whole series, this Rookledge studies, Rookledge University studies in, in Islam, this in political Islam, there's a whole series of these blue books. Um, and they're actually quite good. I don't know if you, if you go online, if you're, a Rutledge, if you're a student here at Rice or the University of Air, um, you know, any university student here, um, these Rookledge studies series that deal with Islam are actually quite interesting. So you might want to um, you know, spend some time. Of course, I have my, my Quran. Don't leave home without it. And then I have this book, um, another book, which is um, the Chef of the Mujalla. If you're familiar with um, late, later um, codification of Islamic um, legal maxims, the uh, Mujalla of uh, it was an Ottoman text. It's actually Ottoman Turkish. Um, it was a, it's a five-volume text. And um, Jawad Pasha, in, from the 1850s to the 1870s, he took. Mostly the works of Ibn Mujayim, and also, for example, other works, for example, of Abdul of, of Iz, for example, and his works on, on Kawa'id, taking the maxims or legal principles, the Kawa'id, the kawaid uh, of Islamic legal theory, and codifying them into a text that would be available for Muslim judges in Ottoman law, law courts. And um, what is, there is an English translation of it which is this English translation I, I bought. Okay, so this is the English translation, and this is one volume, this is volume one of five volumes of the original Ottoman. So the Ottoman text actually is even larger than the Arabic translation with its um, uh, commentary. The, the, the one from Lebanon is about that thick, which is, so the Ottoman text is the original, it's very extensive, and um, of course, you have to go read Turkish and then read Ottoman in order to understand it. I use this also um, for some of the um, sources. I'll be, um, what else? Uh, I did, I, I, I will be quoting from uh, uh, Abu Sufi Effendi, who is, was probably one of the greatest um, legal minds the Ottomans produced. He was the, um, the head of the judiciary during the, during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. So this was a book that was about him, Abu Saud, um, and um, the, Islamic, the Islamic legal tradition. Um, I, he's, I think he's important because he did something which maybe we'll, we'll get into, his, his, uh, his approach towards um, distinguishing as, as it developed between the idea of caliph, uh, the caliph versus the sultan, which we'll, I will talk about that, and the idea of um, Yes, yet, or where the ruler has political discretion or legal discretion in areas where they're not necessarily explicitly Sharia based rulings. And um, we'll discuss that too because that's important. So, but one thing is as we start today, so these are some of the books that I've used and a lot more. And um, I'm, you know, so I just like to, you all know that, you know, I'm just, I'm not just, you know, reading one book, I'm accessing various things, and I just, you know, I need to also, you know, sort of preface this with another point, we may, I'll probably do more than one, is when I embraced Islam in 1982 at Purdue University, at that, and I sort of mentioned similar things like this about that period of the 1980s for me as a convert, you know, when you were a convert in the 1980s, and if you remember those days, well, most of you wouldn't because you weren't even born, unless you were in my age, 50 something, and I just got a Facebook and you know um, mailing from my class graduation in 1982, like 30th anniversary, and something like totally old. I was very curious what people looked like, and people I knew from, from my days at university. They all look old too. <laughs> and um, so I'm thinking, should I go back to my 30th year reunion and just show up as Naeem, you know? And like he became a lawyer and they're still living in Newcastle, and this guy became a Muslim terrorist, you know, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, you know, sort of freaked them out. And I'm my wife go with a full face veil, you know, and it's like, you know, take my kids, they'll just prove it right there, you know, that we were messed up. <laughs> but when I became a Muslim, you know, the big issues, you know, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of 
xenophobia among Muslims at the time. You know, it was at Purdue, and most of the students were from overseas. Um, the mosque at Purdue was very much influenced, but it's a very important, it's a very large engineering school. So we had a lot of students from the Gulf countries. And so Purdue University, and even today it still is, has a very sort of, I would say, Puritan approach towards Islam, the neo salafia I would call them. And they are, and so I, you know, had friends who were, their father, one of my friends is from Kuwait, his father was the leader of the Salafi movement in Kuwait. And um, so I was around people who had really sort of very interesting approaches towards living with non-Muslims and the idea of what Islam is about. And so if you were in the 1980s, things were always, you know, you never called Israel Israel, it was always the Zionist entity. You know, you never called it by Israel, you never gave it that name. Even in Jumaq, it was called the Zionist entity. You know, things were different. And Muslims were very aggressive. And I went to, when I went to Medina, and, I, and for the two years I was in Medina, you know, I met people um, who um, were jihadists, people who had, been, who, who, had, who had been in Afghanistan fighting. Some were American converts. Um, some were from England, from the States. Um, I met uh, a man who was, he and his family tried to overthrow the government of Trinidad in the early 1980s, um, you know, to implement Sharia in Trinidad. And so I met a lot of interesting people in my journeys in life. And um, so I had an earful of hate the Kufar, they're evil, everything is it's all that evil, evil West, you know, Malabad, America, you know, death to America. That was the, the one of the chants, you know, from um, the Iranian Revolution. So I, I met a lot of people. And, and I used to be, as, you know, I want to, you know, oh my, I don't know how to change this. So, um, We'll just look at the picture though. Mm -hmm. Trying to find a picture here. So, you know, things like this, you know, I like this I like this one. Everything I need to know about Islam I learned in 9 11. Nice one. I like that one. And then this one. Because this would have been me, the next picture. I really could have been me at a protest in the 1980s. And it would not have been surprising. That was, that's why I used to think. You know, this is, I could have seen myself pulling up with my back. Now, as a 47 year old experienced Muslim, you know, when you, when you go, when you hit 45 and that's the hump year of your life and death is closer to you than it's ever been, you might start changing. It's easy for an 18 year old, a 20 year old at university to, to, to have a sit in, a walk out, to protest this, protest that, you know. Um, have our own version of an Arab Spring, whatever it may be. Because youth is full of that energy, and also youth is full of ignorance and ignorance. A lot of ignorance. This is really ignorant to do something like this. And I can talk for various reasons why. But um, just one of those reasons is what, which what we might think about is how the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> thought about consequences of our actions, which I will talk about later. About consequences. And a lot of Muslims don't think about their consequences. They're, it's like Abu Kimurad Cambridge said um, <coughs> to me, he was talking about, you know, in the UK I have a lot of Muslims like to protest in the UK, and he was saying, you know, um, Muslims, he says so many different Muslims are, are just, they just throw tantrums. Muslims throw tantrums. There is a spiritual immaturity for the average Muslim. A spiritual immaturity, in a sense that the virtues of a Muslim, of prophetic Islam, of steadfastness, controlling one's anger, controlling one's speech, thinking of consequences, are not always on every Muslim game plan. And so it's not surprising, you know, I, when you, you, you see, you know, that we see things in the news and we, over the years. I mean, for me, it's been a few decades now, more of a lot of angry expressions of, from angry Muslims. So when I was in Medina, I got a lot of angry Muslims around me. And some of who I know, I met there, um, you know, who, I, who are fellow students at Islamic University of Medina, you know, are, are now buried in Bosnia or in places like that because that's what happened to them. They went off and did their jihad and, and they died. And, and some of them, you know, have 
you know, have shaved their beards, moved back to London, and are probably selling, you know, fish and chips. They just totally flip flopped, you know. They they burnt out of their their zeal of their Islamist thing. And I like the word Islamist too, by example. I was looking at the word Islamist, you know. Like I'm an entomologist, so if I'm an entomologist, that means I must use insect in a very negative way. I want to impose insects upon you, because the idea of the word for Islamist is a person who who has who is the man of literature on, this, on, the, on the area of Islam. That's what it actually means. That's what an Islamist is. But now it's, it's a pejorative term, just as jihad is a pejorative term. You know, we don't want to use that word jihad. You, you, don't, want call, you don't want to name yourself mujahid now or, jah, you know, or, you know, or jihad now. Because you, know, you might be a, uh, you know, not a G.I. Joe, but a jihad Joe. Because that's a beautiful word, which is now solely. It's like using gay in 1920, had a pleasant meaning. You say today for many people, it's a negative meaning. And so this is, you know, we have to understand that um, the things I'm talking about is also me showing I have gone through a transformation, how I see things. And, um, and this is not, as, it, as I go to this day, this is not going to be an apologetic. I'm not going to be one of these Muslims trying to just give you an apology or some response or to uh, placate um, at what's outside this room right here because we're in an election year and you know, there's Islamophobia and jihad, for example, is um, a beautiful concept. Sharia is a good word, and even though it's, it's, it's forbidden in Turkey, in Turkish law, for example, and you cannot use that word. You, it's, a, it's, it's one of the, you know, it's a banned word. So you can, for example, in, Tur in Turkey, you can't use the word Sharia in a book, um, in a sense, or a public lecture. You can't advocate it. You can you advocate um, Deen Ilahi, God's religion, but you cannot um, use the word Sharia. You know, there's, a, there's a term in Turkish, you know, the Shariyatji, you know, a supporter of Sharia, as opposed to an Turkju, which is a supporter of Ataturk. And like, so when I was in Turkey, you know, I'd be very careful of the words that we use in talking about things, that you don't say things. Even scholars there, Mashiach, they don't use that word. You have to be very careful. So even in a Muslim majority country, you know, one has to be mindful. So that's the things I want to share with you. So my own background. So the things that I'm expressing today, you know, and as I have grown as a Muslim, um, I the things I'm presenting today are things that I was I was agree with. I'm not just giving you things here just to fill in space and time, but things that I would agree with and advocate as sound understandings. I base it on my understanding uh, over the years of trying to acquire knowledge of this religion. So, understand it that way. I'm not just saying these things just to say it, just for the sake of spending some time with you on this beautiful Saturday, but there's a purpose in it. I think these are things that we need. So I'm gonna give you some knowledge. Think some of these are stuff you will have known, some of it you will not have probably known. Um, if it's, and you know, we will have points of stop points for asking questions. And I will say, okay, I don't have it on the PowerPoint, but you know, they'll be like, okay, we'll stop, any questions on that topic, and then we can move on. I don't want to, you know, talk about cows, we, we covered cows, and now we're doing monkeys. I want to talk about monkeys now, not cow or cattle anymore. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, so these are the things we want to cover today. And when we get to the issue of jihad, kital, and harb, I also want to, uh, I want to cover a couple, I want to cover um, this Ibn Taymiyyah's Marni Fatwa. And then um, I also want to cover Sheikh Muhammad Afif uh, Atiki's uh, recent right, uh, position, uh, a fatwa he gave from, from Oxford. And I also then want to cover an Arabic text here. This is uh, from Roland Abuti's um, Al Jihad al Islam. Kaifa Nafhamahu wa Kaifa Numarisuhu. Jihad in Islam, how do we understand it and how do we apply it? This is a contemporary text. If you know uh, Roland Abuti, he's probably one of the most foremost. I think he's a brilliant um, 
Syrian scholar, one of the most brilliant scholars we have today. And his works, um, the Arabic is always very complicated. And he has a discussion on a well-known hadith, because we want to talk, but we'll cover two, a verse of the Quran, which is Surah Tawbah, verse number 9, which is the, the ayat of the sword, okay, which is one which many people who advocate um, jihad in a sense of open, uh, um, using jihad as, an, uh, as a means to assault non-Muslims, whether combatants or not, um, this and, and that this verse in Surah Tawbah has been abrogate, abrogates any previous verse of the Quran that, that may imply having civil or peaceful relations with non-Muslims. And then this hadith, then this hadith, one uh, hadith, umut one al nas. I have been commanded to find the people until they bear witness there is no God but God. Is this is the hadith which is cited for that? So I want to go through uh, Rama Muti's discussion of this hadith to refute the usage of this hadith, which is also a refutation of the usage of that verse from Surah Tawbah. So we want to cover that too. Um, but I have to do it from the Arabic, because this book hasn't been translated into English, and so you're going to have to bear with me as I go through it today, inshallah. Okay. So those are the things I want to cover today. So have fun taking notes. So some is not written here. Some is not on here, for example, so that's all right. Um, so let's just go then. Any questions on that? My intro? That was a big intro, wasn't it? Okay, just gonna... So, defining Sharia. So here we are, I like that. So the first thing is, I have this quote here by Imam Haskafi. Imam Haskafi, um, uh, in the well-known medie uh, late medieval Hanafi uh, jurist, um, he wrote, Radl Mukhtar and then Ibn Abadeen in the 19 teens and twenties did his commentary on that. Um, and he and and he, and his Dura Multab is also one of his texts, so he different texts by the way, so whoever does not understand the people of his times is ignorant. And what he's saying here is that we have to contextualize our jurisprudence and our articulations from sacred law in the context we live in. So that's important. You have to contextualize your situation right now as you discuss things. Though you may be relying upon you know, medieval texts or late medieval texts or into the modern period. And in modern, I use the word modern, I'm talking about in our contemporary Western use of the word modern, I'm talking about you know, from the late um, 15th century forward you know, until the 21st century we're in. But you have to contextualize yourself just to quote, for example, something from the past may not make it applicable today. To give you an example, if you take Sheikh Du Keller's um, English translation of Holmes the Sally, the Three Lines of the Traveler, you'll notice that he gives you the complete Arabic text. But what does he not translate? He doesn't translate any, he leaves the Arabic text, he doesn't translate any of the fic that deals with slavery or issues of slavery. He doesn't remove them from the original text. But he doesn't consider them relevant in a contemporary discussion, so there's no need to translate them. So that's a good approach. And we have to also understand, and which I will try to make that clear today, is this idea of Sharia is a very it, it is fluid. It is fluid. And it's not a monolithic crystalline thing that exists. And we have to be mindful, and I can understand I get a big soapbox right now to understand that. And you need to share this with your, with your friends. You hear someone says, Islam says this. What does Islam say about that? That makes no sense at all. Islam doesn't say anything. Now you can quote the Quran, and you can quote a hadith, and you can say Islam says that. And you can quote, and it's easy to quote verbatim. For example, umirtu onu katalanas. And you can walk away with that. But what does it mean? How do you apply it? Well, that's the problem. That's a Muslim giving you a, an interpretation, an understanding. So when you say Islam says this, what you're actually saying is Muslim scholars and people not are saying probably many things on that point. And you should leave it at that. Understand that. It's, it's, when we live in a time where our Islam has been reduced and reduced and reduced 
where we go around saying Islam says this and Islam says that, we're not even living in reality at the moment. Because there are voices amongst the Muslims. It's like the idea of Sharia. What is this Sharia? I was listening to BBC Radio, to give you an example. As you know, they had the first parliamentary meeting after this, they had the first parliamentary sessions after, you know, it's been a year now since you know, the Arab Spring for them, and um, the Ikhwan Samun and the Salafiyun have majority of seats in the current parliament. So what they did was a BBC reporter went down to, not in Cairo, went down about a thousand miles up the Nile, which is south, right, to some villages um, in Aswan, and was doing a report of visiting these villages that had a very large Salafi community there. And um, in the Salafi community, you know, the two men that were report that according to the reporter, one was a man with a big beard and a long bow, and his friend who didn't have a beard, but. They were talking about, in the, in the report, about how when Sharia comes, when we start cutting off people's hands in Saudi Arabia, we will see a dramatic decline in theft. Just, and then, they, and then the man without the beer was saying, you see, this, does, you see this is what's happening in Saudi Arabia, he said. Well, obviously the Saudis, you can go online around, they, have, they don't do amputations, by the way. I lived in Saudi Arabia and I saw one beheading in public. I saw one public beheading in my years in Saudi Arabia. Have you, ever seen a public, have you ever seen that before in your life? You've seen it on TV, right? But have you ever seen one on TV? You should see one live. <laughs> because the Muslims come out of Juma, I swear you can sell popcorn at the public execution. Because they're all like, no, we don't want to see it. No, 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 we don't want to see it. No, you can, I, I could have, you know, I could have, you could have sold tickets for it. And it was outside of Juma Mosque, and, and, and it, was, it, it was in Jeddah. And it was, the, it was a Juma Mosque, which is, has a Maidan outside it, which is a public execution. Zone. And um, the man was accused, he was accused from Pakistan. <laughs> and he was accused of bringing in drugs. Of course, it's a, it's a capital punishment to bring in drugs in Saudi Arabia. Whether or not he did or not, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know the court case. But I saw his head become severed from his body. And um, that's a, it was impressive, to say the least. Made me think. You know. At that time, of course, remember I was I was a different naive. I was a different naive. You see, than I am now. Because if I was thinking then, it was like, and I was like, I would make dua for the man, Allah forgive him for his sin, make this a telco for him. That was my intent. I wasn't there to to gawk, you know. And then afterwards, say, well, wasn't that really cool to get him? I didn't. I wasn't there for that. I was actually making dua for him, but I didn't. Really think now. I think now I might think more like Tariq uh, uh, Ramadan about well, should we even apply that now in our time? Because why was this man bringing drugs in from Pakistan in the first place? What economic situation was he in that might force him to want to bring drugs to a wealthier society in order to survive, maybe economically? Those are the things we should think of before. But you see, the man on the BBC interview, the you talk cutting off hands. He's thinking, and I heard this so much, I heard this argument so much, you hear it today from Muslims. When Sharia comes, things will get straightened up. And of course, they mean what? When we stone adulterers and veil women, and we cut off hands, we'll have justice. And we'll all live together, worshiping Allah, Allah, and praying for each other, and doing charity and good works, and, and look, we're looking out for justice, and yeah, really? Because this is how simplified we see it, so many people. So, so, so simple. And that is not the mindset you ever would understand from the earliest Muslims who had knowledge. Even the Prophet himself saw so it. Okay. So, we need then to understand the idea of Sharia itself in our minds. We need to readjust what it means. What does it mean? Because it has different meanings. And even the common words you use every day in your religion, Islam, Iman, for example, have different meanings. It depends on what context you're using them. If you want a good understanding of that, all you have to do is read um, from 
Ibn Rajab's commentary to Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith, when he does, when he does a commentary on the, the Gabriel hadith, he goes to a detailed um, analysis of linguistics where sometimes Islam can mean Iman, and sometimes Iman means Islam, and it, in different hadith, in different verses of the Quran, because they are interchangeable meanings at times. But you know, the average Muslim doesn't think this way. And we don't even look at the number of people. This has been advertised for how many days now? And who shows up? Because no one wants to show up. Because we would prefer to be jahil, ignorant, and a little ivory towers of our understandings of this religion than actually trying to understand what God wants from us. And if you don't have knowledge, then you have nothing in this need. Because everything is based upon knowledge. Even your, even your, even if you're a Sufi, even your personal experiences in your spiritual journey have to conform to what the theologian says. You cannot take your experience and trump the theologian. So if you have an experience in your spiritual journey that says that God is creation, well, that's a wrong experience because this is not what the theologian says. So you let your own experience be trumped by a text or a verdict outside you, though your personal experience is telling you to the core of your being that the jurist is wrong and you're right. That's not the copy. The jurist is right and you're wrong. So, on that point, for example, that's a broad statement. So we have to understand our situation. So Ali, can I think? Oh, I can do that. So here's another one. So let's behead those who. Insult. So I, I like the guy in the picture wearing, covering his face. Maybe it was a cold day. Uh, I'm from Slovenia. Okay, it's a cold day. He's got gloves on. But maybe he's hiding his identity. But you know, in England, it's the land of CCTV cameras, you know, and they're gonna find you. You know, for who's holding that sign? Of course, if you do that today. And this is all almost seriously. And I lived in England for a year in Bradford, which has the largest Muslim concentration of any city outside of the Muslim world. It's in Bradford, England. There are about 50,000 50, plus Muslims in Bradford. I mean, you have no Urdu to go to the bank. <laughs> you know, I go to bar, and I have no, I know, no thing in Urdu. Like, well, you know, and I always joke, you know, I came to England to speak English and I was in, had to learn Urdu, you know, it's like, you know. It was like, you know, it's fine, we're just a nice language, you know, but, but that's how it was. And I had a lot of things like that living there. This little enclave of Muslims. And of course they have, it's like an enclave, a boiling enclave of Diobandis and Raelis and Tablighis and the Tahriris and Salafis and Jihadis, all living on the same area and making tech fear to each other. You're a Kafir, or you're an innovator, and oh, it's, it's amazing. it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> But I'm like, you know, good curry and biryani and kebab, so, you know, the, the cuisine negotiated the, uh, the obscene, <laughs> right? So, alhamdulillah. So, so, as we are now in election year, I want to quote Newt Gingrich, who may be our new president, we hope not, we should have a day of prayer that he doesn't become our next president. Because it's all we need, you know. He should, you know, for our laws, he should be stoned right. for his, you know, fidelity problems there, you know. <laughs> and he probably, you know, of course, you know, from his perspective, being very, as a Catholic now, the blood of Christ has taken care of that problem of those infidelities, you know. But for us, you know, public proclamation of adultery is probably, you know, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway. So, um, but I thought, you know, he was speaking, you know, in 20, July 20, 2010, the American Enterprise, I love the American Enterprise Institute, one of those, you know, uh, homegrown places, right? And um, obviously they're very anti-Islam, you can go to their website, you know, you can go to Jihad Watch and all those places, you know, those fun websites. And um, he was with his wife, and this is, this is what um, he said, so he, I, I admire deeply Ayan Hirsi Ali, because she is one of our great advocates for Islam today. She's an expert 
And um, you know, she's like one of the darlings for those who are the Islamic, Islamic foes. She's a darling for them. So I'm being sort of, you know, not neutral about this discussion. Who has done as much as any one person serve as a personal witness and testify to the concepts I'm going to be outlining. The fight against Sharia and the madrasas and mosques which teach hatred and fanaticism is, is the heart of the enemy a movement from which the terrorists spring forth. I studied, stop there, don't read ahead. I studied in a madrasa in Turkey for years. I studied the same text when I visited a daughter of Bloom, Banuri town in, in Karachi in 1999 in November because I was thinking about going to study there. After the earthquake in Turkey, I thought, well, now I should leave Turkey, so the place is seismically safe. So I was, so um, my sheikh was in Medina, so he gave me, he made an istikhara for me, that if I wanted to check out Pakistan to go, so on his istikhara, he did that and actually in Mecca, it was okay, so I went to Pakistan for three weeks, I got intestinal problems while I was there, <laughs> and, um, and I met some wonderful people at Dar al the Nori town, it's one of the big Dar al um, Giovan, my dresses. I didn't go to the green German people, a lot less than I didn't go to them. Um, I didn't know much about them at that time, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure we had a totally different experience. I guess it was the Mazda, all the Christmas lights on it. And, um, and it was a big one there, downtown Karachi, lots of Christmas lights on it. I thought, wow, that's really weird, really Christmas lights on it. Anyway, I, I wasn't very familiar with that, with you know, the railway movement, mashallah. So, I mean, mashallah for them, I mean, I'm not sure I didn't know. And, um, <laughs> And I went there, and they were nice people, and I would say that their curriculum was basically the same as I was studying in Istanbul under modern Turks. And there were a lot of students there at Dar al from Afghanistan, and um, from the, the, the frontier, Northwest Frontier Province, you know. And, but, you know, I, the, three, the three weeks I was visiting, I didn't pick up anything weird. And when I left, you know, it's like, you know, they're reading, you know, as I thought about the experience, I think they were reading the same books I was reading, Hanifi Fifth, and Sarf, and Naho, and Alida. And, you know, so why did I turn out like this, and some of them turn out like that? I don't know. Well, I do have some ideas. So, madrasas aren't honestly bad places. Necessarily. I mean, I went to one, and I don't think I turned out too bad. You, know, you all disagree about that, but I personally don't feel I turned out too bad. Okay. Uh, I think I'm a pretty level-headed person. It's time we had an actual debate on this. Really, on my dresses. I can the heaps I'm out there, you know. One of the things I'm going to suggest today is a federal law which says no court anywhere in the United States under any circumstance is allowed to consider Sharia as a replacement for American law. Let me draw a sharp distinction between those Muslims who live in the modern world and those Muslims who would radically change the modern world. Radical Islamists, there's that word Islamist. I'm an Islamist by the definition of what the word actually means. I'm a, a man of literature, of literature and of letters of Islam, I believe. I'm an Islamist. Not as he uses it. I believe in one living God, and I believe that God has revealed of His will in divine revelation in the Quran, and Muhammad Sallallahu articulates that for us and templates it out for us. That makes me an Islamist, then alhamdulillah, I don't mind the IST after the word Islam. It's not a problem with me. But radical Islamists, you know, and it's like they have to go together, so I don't know. Want to impose Sharia on all of us for legitimate reasons. For their religion reasons, obviously. I mean, for Muslims, you know, Islamists wants to impose it. Let me, be quite, let me be quite clear. You can respect your adversary without agreeing or giving in. They have profound, deeply held beliefs, and one of the great challenges for secularists is they can't understand the level of passion that a belief which is derived from an underlying religious form leads one to have. And that's true. It's very hard for a secular person to understand a Muslim, just as it's hard for a secular person to understand a fundamentalist Christian or an Orthodox Jew, or an Orthodox Hindu, or any quote-unquote orthopractic person within their tr faith tradition. Which is why, frankly, deep, frankly, deeply believing Christians and Jews, Jewish Americans have a much better understanding of what's going on 
than do, sec than do secular individuals in deracinated universities looking out of their ivory tower or trying to wonder what it is that would lead people to kill themselves and having no comprehension of the emotions and the depths of passion and engagement. I agree. It's funny. I, on that point, I would say, yeah, well, you know, these university people who study Islam, I wonder, you know, what, you know, anyone can write books on Islam. Anyone can write books. Um, Chameleon's okay. The other people, you know, they, but, you know, and it's, it, you know, but Islam is your, is your job to have to understand intellectually. You know, there's good in that, and you, I think we can benefit, but I think it's also, um, you know, we have to be sort of, as a, as a practicing Muslim, we need to not always, you know, just take it hook, line, and sinker, and sinker on that point. Sharia, in its natural form, I like this now, this is, has principles and punishments totally abhorrent to the Western world. <gasps> so I, I want to talk about day. I want to talk about some of these underlying principles. Are they really abhorrent? Now, obviously, there are punishments in Islam which are abhorrent. I agree, they are tough. If you could ever really apply them, because as, as we all know as Muslims, um, it's almost impossible to apply the laws, the hard, the hard punishments, which I was going to talk about, which I'm not talking about today. But I can say this right now. Even from within the context of the legal tradition, it's all the, the conditions that are placed up there to apply the penalties of Islam, the hadud, are almost impossible. So for us to think, for example, there was this movie, it was a movie about uh, it was, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and in the scene of the movie, this kid is caught stealing something, and the janissary comes up, and he just grabs it and cuts his hand off. And, uh, and it was, it was, that was in the movie. It's like, it's like you know, it's like, it, it was, um, what do you call that kind of, what do you call that justice when it happens at the moment? What's it called? There's a term for that in English. Huh? Come on, you university smart people. Huh? Swift justice? Not swift justice. It's called something else. At the moment, it's done. Well, obviously, that has nothing to do with Islam. Maybe ultimately a hand being cut off. May definitely, but uh, so may summary, like a summary application or execution of 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 it. It doesn't happen that way. You can't happen that way. It can't. First of all, it would, it would take a judge to make that determination, not a soldier, by the way. You know, even so, even you know the, the movie itself, which is not a Hollywood movie, I think it was a Turkish movie, got its facts wrong. You know, I mean, it was just one of those Hollywood versions of Islam. And I think a lot of people are getting there as Hollywood version of Islam. And of course, we have Muslims living in their fantasy Islam. Their version of what Islam is about, what oh God wants us to do at this moment. And, of course, without deep reflection and knowledge, you can easily make, and I'll show some of those mistakes today that we, that we have to deal with. And um, in a sense of textual errors in documents or a hadith I will quote, which you're not going to find in the six major clutches of hadith. You won't find it at all. But if you don't have the hadith, you can, you can butcher the religion without this hadith as a, as a, as a, um, a measure to withhold the application of the penalties. But you won't find any of the six canonical collections of hadith though. So if you just live in the Ketubah Sitta, the six collections, you should, sorry, you, you missed out. And if you do find it sincerely, but it's, it's considered weak, therefore you would have rejected it. If you were strict, person when it comes to rejecting the hadith, as some people are, for good reasons, I will not question that, the reasons, the intention, but the application of mine. So, an underlying basic belief, which is that law comes directly from God and is therefore imposed upon humans, that God imposes upon us, and that sounds really negative. And no humans can change law, no humans can change it. That's a fallacy right there. Humans can change the law. But I'll explain that, what I mean by that. Without it being an act of apostasy, I don't know what book he was reading to get this information. And he's the president. I hope not. 
is a fundamental violation of a tradition in the Western system. So I want to talk today about the Western tradition, which goes back to Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem, and which has evolved in giving us freedom across the planet on a scale we can hardly imagine, and which is now directly threatened by those who would impose it. Another point of, the, of his lecture. So I think we are faced, I don't know what, and so that's where I stop. And I think it was the quote. When you, when you recognize, for example, that Sharia requires four male witnesses to rape, in the absence of four male witnesses, the complainant is herself guilty. And I was going to talk about that. Um, Ali brought up, he sent me a document on um, the, the, the uh, restructuring or redoing of penalties in Pakistani legal um, uh, system about this issue. But that's, that's but the, you know, I'm getting it because I won't have time to cover that. But it's on my computer if you want me to bring it up or that doc, I have it somewhere. But the point is, that's not true about this, this thing of his, for example. And um, there's the, I you know, have it here, I got fine. I should actually look at my notes there, should I? Um, you know, this idea of Zina the Jabba that's forced fornication, which is rape. Which is not, which is, you know, some of the, some jurists did say, they argued a case that since it's called Zina, since it's called Zina, you have to apply the penalty because it's called Zina. So that was an argument because of a linguistic usage of a, of a word. But what it actually means, and this has been understood, and, and you, when you look at the deeper discussion, is that any woman who is forced some Maliki scholars said that, well, if she becomes pregnant from a rape, then she's guilty, which seemed rather almost nonsensical. And I agree, I will agree, you can read things in juridical works that are nonsensical. And just because it's in a work of a, a well-known jurist on some point, it's not written in stone. It didn't come from you know, Mount Sinai and four, two tablets. It's an ishtihad, a statement, an effort of a scholar, and it can be wrong. So we have to understand it. Anything I'm telling you can be wrong today. Okay? Now, yeah, I would accept that. I'm not a fool. But we have to be careful also, you know, on this point that just because a jurist has a position, because I will bring up some points today on the Makassid of Sharia, where is there benefit for us to even take that position if it's available for us? But this statement of his is wrong. So if he's gone to, to you know, um, Miss Hirsi Ali to get his information, and she was like, you know, his, his, his source, well, she was probably wrong too. But, you know, when she and Yushad Manji come together, wow, they become like experts. And I'm sure they're experts on their own. You know, maybe, they, maybe they're hooking up, you know, at the bar, I don't know. But whatever the thing is, they're not experts. They be experts on witnessing, a witnessing abuse. Abuse. I have no problem with that. But that you're an expert on uh, defining religion, I would question it. Because you know, uh, we have to be very careful. You know, we can talk theory here about Islam. We also have to understand we do have problems in our Muslim community and, and globally. And there are issues there that need to be worked out. And, uh, but, you know, it's not going to happen here, and it's not going to happen today. These are some things that are in place that would take generations probably to, to alter. I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, in the early, late 60s and the early 70s, America was really bad at throwing trash on the roads, man. America was trashy. Highways were trashy. There was trash here, trash. It's like traveling in Saturday Arabia today, you know, from between Mecca and Medina. The highway is full of plastic bags and trees that were it was thrown plastic bottles and bags. Okay? And America was like that when I was a kid, when I was little. And then in the late, the late, you know, it was the environmental movement of the, of, the, of the early 70s, and we had this, you know, education process to educate Americans. We learned in school, we saw the advertisements, and we saw change. Uh, people start not to throw stuff out of their car window. So today, if you see someone do it, you freak out. 
You freak out. You get mad. I'm driving on the road and I see, he must be an immigrant doing something like that. Because, you know, people just don't do that anymore. Because what we did 40 years ago, and we have to be educated on a national level to just to teach us not to throw trash out. So why about Muslims trying to, culturally trying to, when, when you have a mishmash between religion and culture at times, and you can't say, for example, the idea of honor killings, killings. How do we separate these things? And yet, at the same time, for example, Abu Saud, for example, if you read his Fatawa, he justifies honor killing, which I found very interesting. And the reason he justified it, apparently, is because of the fact he was part of the culture and he couldn't do away with it. So it subsumed. It was like, it was, it was included. So honor killing has made nothing technically to do with Islam, technically, but the concept of honor does, definitely. And it's easy to cross over between the concept of honor, which is a makasit of Sharia, according to al karafi which is the objectives of Missouri honor, and you already have this concept of honor already of a woman's body as being, you know, a domain of male dominance and represent, representing if it's not guarded, it becomes dishonorable for the family. It's easy to see even more that it can cross over. And it did when he gave some fatawa answers, um, in, you know, in the 16th century. In, in, as a, as a juror says he was. So the point is, there are things that, you know, if someone said to me, for example, is honor killing Islamic? I would say no. But has it been subsumed in it? Yes. For some, some Muslims, yes, apparently. Is that a problem? Yes. So, but then, of course, I can go to the U.S. Constitution and find that black people are still considered two-thirds and in, in still, in still in the Constitution. But they don't follow that law. But they didn't erase it when it came to census taking. It's still there. It's an artifact because once it was a reality. But does it mean that, you know, does it mean, though, that one day we can go back and repeal other amendments and bring back that one for our census taking? I, th I suppose theoretically it does. If you get enough votes on the House and Senate that you need in order to repeal something, an amendment, I suppose we could go back there since it's there by the fact it's there according to the Founding Fathers. So, even with our, you know, our booted up democratic constitutional government, you know, there could even be inherent problems there if one wants to find them. So as Muslims, you know, we are always in a process of change in the sense of seeking out what is what we should be doing is seeking out what's best for us and our time, for our people, our co-religious and others. I make this a general statement. So first thing is about the universality of this uh, this sacred law. Which I haven't really, you know, um, gotten down to, you know, discussing in details, you know, uh, yet and defining it. So I need to take a break for a second. Any questions on anything that I've covered? No. What time is it? Well, I've been talking about an hour. You want me to stop talking for a few minutes so you can like get up and take a five-minute break, or you want me to continue talking until maybe eleven o'clock or something? No? You're, no? You guys are here? Okay. Okay, I'll continue then. So in this verse in Surah Araf, Qul Nas inni Rasulullah ilaykum jamian. So that's one thing you should understand is that the and this is nothing new for you, but people need to understand this, is that yes, Muhammad so something came to all mankind. This is not it's not a geographically limited message. It is a universal message. And we know this as Muslims, but you need to go through the evidence for it. There's a verse, make a note of it, you've got your handout. That, that's something you need to know. 
And in Sahih Bukhari, uh, a messenger has been sent. He, Sahih said, a messenger has been sent to each community individually. I have been sent to all mankind. So we understand Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has this universality about him. That means then that the concept of Ummah is extend to all people. All people are part of his Ummah. Whether or not they are those who have come to it as Muslims or accept his call or they're still waiting to do that. But that's something I think as Muslims we should understand. I think most of us understand that. Okay, we understand that. So I'm not giving you um, anything new probably in this verse. Um, can you read that? وَيَعْكُمْ أَحْلَ إِنْجِيلُ بِمَا أَنْزَلَ Allah fi wa miyakum bima anzallah ulaikum mufasakun. The point of this verse is um, when you go down to the third line, Ja'ana minkum shir'atan wa min hajin. Allah has said that we have, we have placed um, amongst you or for you minkum ja'ala, ja'ala min, placed for you shir'a wa min hajin. So the idea of the the root of the word Sharia. This is one of the mentionings in the Quran, the idea of Shia and Minhaj, the idea of this idea of, of paths and places to walk, which we'll get to. Okay, so that's why I put this verse up there specifically because of its using of the usage of the verb uh, Shia from the verb Shara'a in Arabic. Okay. And here we have some then from Surah Hadith. لَكَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رَسُولُنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ We are sending out our messengers with the Bayinat. That's also uh, one of the names of Bayinat for the Quran itself. What mean مَعَهُمْ الْكِتَابِ وَبِزَانِ The scripture and the, and the scale. وَتَقُومُ وَالنَّاسَ بِالْقِسْ This idea of qis, which we'll get to, the idea of justice and equitableness is there. وَأَنْزَلْنَا حَدِيدًا فِيهِ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا وَنَافِ لِلنَّاسِ this is all mentions he sends down iron from the sky. Commentary on that. And then the next verse um, that we have there is number 18, particularly. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا عَلَى شَرِيَةٍ مِنْ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا So follow it. So here the actual word sharia itself is, made, is mentioned in the Quran. In sort of Ajatiya, verse, uh, verse number 16. And Allah Ta'ala commands us here in this and actually he's commanding the Prophet, which is a, a universal command for all of us, but tabi uh, follow it, ittiba, obedient following. This is what the, that word technically means. And don't follow the hawa. So the idea that the sharia, and this idea of sharia, sort of juxtapose the thing called tawa, the idea of capri. And that's something I think that we need to take away from this, at least this verse, is that there are numerous hadith, the Prophet warns us about following our hawa, that you follow your kabir. <coughs> now one of you believes that his is hawa, his is, 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 is that which is in your jalba, in your, in, your, in your current nature perhaps, that you have in yourself, this um, inclination as you have towards things. And so until your inclinations, your hawa, are in this idea of following what Muhammad has brought, your faith isn't yet complete. The fullness of faith isn't there. So for a Muslim then, the idea of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shir'an or shari'atan, in a legal construct, is important, but I want it. But we have to extend this idea, though. This idea, because it's not merely a legal meaning here. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we'll get to that one. So let me cover these two right here for you. So Talik Ramadan, in his, in, this is a book of his. It's, uh, it's a pretty good book. He, when I was with him in 2004 in Sydney, he gave me a signed copy of this book. I just realized that, you know, when I was looking through it, he had signed it for me. 
he and I were on a speaking tour together in 2004 in Sydney. First time I went to Australia. He said, Asharia, on the basis of the root of the word, means the way, the path leading to the source, and outlines a global conception of creation, existence, death, and the way of life it entails, stemming from a normative reading and an understanding of scriptural sources. It determines how to be a Muslim. So the idea then is that God has sent down something. And of course, that's the Quran. That's their first clue there. That is, if there's, if there's this thing called Sharia, it's embodied in the scripture that has come. So one might say then, in a larger understanding, the Quran is the Sharia. This is for us, maybe keep that in mind, that the Quran is the Sharia. That's a broader understanding. But that means also that Muhammad is also the Sharia. Because he is also part of that which has come from God. He is sent to us a messenger, for example. So these two things, the, the Quran and the Prophet in that understanding, are Sharia for us. In a sense, they are the means to return to God. They are our points of connectivity with God as God is. Not God as we may think God is, but in a sense how God has conveyed knowledge to us directly that we can have this interfacing with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, but he says, Ashriya for, for jurists is the corpus of general principles of Islamic law extracted from its two fundamental sources, the Quran and the Sunnah. And then we have our understanding of as a legal tradition. And that's what most of us understand by Shadi in that. It's this idea of a, of a sacred law. And though that is true, that's a jurist understanding. That's not necessarily a pure Quranic understanding of the word. So keep that in mind. So if you're talking with someone, you need to make sure someone understands, you know, that you, you draw this level, you know, between, uh, which we'll get to that, you know, I'll just do that right here. Um, and then Abu Sa'ud, for example, in, the, in this text by, by Colin Imber on Abu Sa'ud, which I thought was, it was okay. The general word for law is shara or to give it the form in common usage known as sharia, this term has both a metaphysical and practical usage. So that's the idea. The metaphysical, this knowledge which has come from God. Shira'atan wa minhajan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And then the practical usage, which is the concept of a sacred law that the jurist speaks of. In the metaphysical sense, the sharia is a law of God, which is ultimately unknowable. And this is what, uh, uh, Oh, uh, what's his name? Of, he's in the uh, University, University, University of California, LA School of Law. Huh? No, 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 he's at Georgetown. Uh, he wrote The Great Theft. He's the well known Mutazalite. Huh? Huh? Yeah, huh? Yeah, Mufadl. Yeah, he does talk about Sharia this way. Sharia has this. What that idea of Sharia with the capital yeah. SH, which, which exists in the mind of God. I don't like that word, mind of God. Personally, it, that's very Mutazalite. The other boys hung up on the intellect. So God must have the mind like that too, apparently. But he uses that. He uses it in, in I know, his book, The Great Theft. That's why we just sit up. Khal Abu Fadl. So, yes, he used that term. So he's, you know, he's, I mean, he. I mean, I can't, uh, I may not agree with him, I think he writes, but I don't disagree with the fact that he's knowledgeable. Uh, but the point is, he uses the idea that Sharia is the idea of that which is with the knowledge of God. So in a sense, there's, it's, all, it's, it's inscrutable in a way then. We cannot circumscribe God's knowledge. And I think any Muslim on a base level understands that. That which is with God is with God and it extends beyond our capacity to truly circumscribe it intellectually, comprehensively. Because we are created things and the greater is, is, is true nature is, extends, it extends where the creation doesn't extend to. I'll leave it at that. But he says here, the science of jurisprudence or fake represents the efforts of the jurors to discover God's law and in this sense legal writing are worked Legal writing are works of fiqh or rather than of sharia, works on jurisprudence rather than statements of the law. 
and practical usage of our Sharia means simply the law as jurists have enunciated as distinct from secular law, which rulers also have promulgated. That's true. So we might have this concept of Sharia, right? And we might have the concept of Siyasi or Kanun. And the word Siyasi is very much uh, a term used, and Kanun was used by, by Ottoman jurists. The idea of Siyasi being these two being at the discretion of the sultan or the rule, or that not necessarily are direct from sharia or sharia as a work of jurists, the fuqaha, in deriving the sharia through fiqh, for example, using that language. So, this is, I think, you know, I, I like this statement. It gives you, you know, it does sort of ground us in how we want to see things. And, um, other statements, Ibn Ashur in his, in his um, treatise on Makas al Sharia said that the main objective of the Sharia is to establish a strong community with a sta stable social system and promote the orderly functioning of its affairs by achieving its welfare and preventing evil. So you want to seek the maslaha and you want to avoid the mafasid, the things that are that bring us, you know, the word almost solid, an almost solid, something which is a right deed, that's the maslaha, they're seeking the, the welfare, and you're trying to avoid the mufasid, the things that bring facade or corruption. And you want that on a communal level, on a communal level, for everyone in the community. Everyone in the community, Muslim or non-Muslim. This, this is an objective of the sacred law, and it does it on many levels, which we will, have, we will cover today, inshallah, that is. And then Allah SWT mentions مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَنْ أَوْ أُنْثَى أَوْ هُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ So Allah mentions whoever does right to it. So the idea of being solid, and that's such an important word. You know, that's one of those words, as a Muslim, you really need to understand the verb salaha. Because it is, you know, you know, I say that there are certain, if you ask me, you know, there are certain words in, in the Quran that, you know, are in the tradition that you should know. Um, salaha is one of them. Qama is one of them. Um, Khalaka is one of them. Um, uh, Amina, Salama. These are all words um, that I think are very important. But these three are so important because they really are interchangeably used linguistically in the Quran and the Hadith tradition to various things, so we need, uh, for example, khalq, idea of creation, the creation of an idea of character traits, khul, uh, sola, uh, whether it's sul, reconciliation between factions, um, husband and wife, and problem between warring uh, two men fighting or whatever, but it's sul, whereas amal sala, something meaning a right deed, uh, something which is correct, the concept of righteous or rightness of action, um, the idea of dinu, dinu, uh, the mustaqim, is a derivative mustaqim, a derivative from that, something which is straight, something which is upright, beyond in prayer, for example, established prayer. These are very important words. You know, there are certain verbs in the Quran which are used in many ways, which become sort of like the key semantic um, platform of God's discourse to humanity in the Arabic language. And I think these are some of them. So you really should be curious about this, actually. You should actually be very curious about this. You know, uh, this use of words, the language of God. So, man amina salihan, he who does rightness. Right? Uh, so Allah says what, you know? Huh? It's going to give you what? Hayat tayyiba. You're going to have nuhinamu. Uh, we will give him, cause him to live. A right line, a hayat tayyib. God wants us to have tayyib. In the law tayyib, and he says, wala yaqlu in the tayyib. When the law amara a mu'mineen, bima amara a mu'mineen, God is tayyib, right and pure and good, only accept that which is accept that which is right and pure and good. And he has commanded the believers that which he has commanded what? The messengers. So having a life that is tayyib, that eat Buddha's halal and tayyib, right? Is what God wants for us. He wants us to have this. And even something as brutal, if it had to come to that, of an, of an amputation, for, if it, for example, its objective is only that tayyib life. 
even that. Okay, even that itself. And the Muslim has to really understand that. And others need to understand that too, you know, that you know, we're not a bunch of screaming barbarians. Jews. Most of us aren't Jews. They're the ones that have drones with their names on them. Yeah, they're being, they're being, you know. That's the new warfare, right? They're taking out the military, coming back, you know, and this is going to be you know, the, new, the new military, you know, a more mean, mean military, you know, lots of technology, you know, and fewer foot soldiers and more. <laughs> getting you when you don't know it. Right now, it's probably one coming here towards us right now, you know. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so my mysterious he goes off the highway. <laughs> Join a conspiracy group and you'll understand what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, Allah says, وَاَتَاسْمُ بِحَبْدُ اللَّهِ And hold fastly together, all of you. Let the فَرْرَكُ Right? And you can read it here, you know, I need some verses that you're familiar with. And at least it is. وَذْكُرْ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ The idea of نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ is so much Allah reminds us in the Quran by Israel. Remember the نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ is نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ Allah has given us نِعْمَةُ Ni'mat are abundance of provision and good things for us. Something that brings you ni'mat. Something that brings you joy when you see it. And pleasure to you when you experience it. This is what really God wants for us. He doesn't want us to have, you know, a life that's to drag. Oh, I'm tired of being a Muslim. You know, this country is just so hard and what's it all about. God doesn't want us to have doubt, doesn't want us to have these things. Obviously, I don't believe that at all. I really don't believe that. I could probably start racking my brain and come up with lots of evidences scripturally from the Nasus, from the, the principal scriptural sources, the Quran and tradition, to support this belief that I have that God doesn't want me to be a really oppressed one guy. He you know, doesn't want that for me. I may myself choose that in my own self, you know, you know De deprecating way, but I don't honestly he wants it for any for any person. Don't be allowed to choose it. But that's theology 101 discussion enough for me today. So what it says what? When you were enemies, is kuntum when you were enemies, so even when you had your when you were bumping heads, he wanted you, Allah bring together and bring together. That's what the Talib collected, right? You know? Is that whole movement, you know, in the in the Bay Area. Is what? Is that where Ta'li comes from the verb Alafa? It's the Masta, right? The idea of bringing hearts together. Bringing people together. Well, bringing yourself together, right? Bain al between your hearts. SubhanAllah. Allah wants us to have a good life. And we may choose otherwise. So. Shari refers to all the elements of a proper, i.e. righteous life. This includes moral behavior, proper respect towards God, correct belief, personal piety, and so on. In other words, it means the right way to live one's life as a Muslim and conform to God's will. We all know we agree with that. But look at this. What is Shari? I, got, I borrowed this from um, Aftab Malik. You know Aftab Malik, he's very, popular, very active you know, in the UK. He does a lot of the books of traditional, does a lot of publishing of traditional texts. And, um, he has this on his, I'm going to stop, this is where I'm going to stop right now, we're going to take a break. Um, so, what is Sharia? Well, there can be more than one answer to this question. So look at this picture here. The idea of Sharia is this big thing, and it has two sources. The Sharia is Quran and Sunnah. It's thick, which comes in, the, the, the fuqah, to apply yourself intellectually to, under, to look at the two sources, the Quran and the Sunnah, to apply yourself to extract an understanding. That's fit. So, fit equals understanding, jurisprudence, comprehension, the huge collection of juridical opinions, fatwa by jurists, fuqaha, in regards to application of sharia. Requires extensive knowledge of the sources of law. Represented by, and so sharia is represented by a set of principles and methodologies for the production of legal ruling. That's true, we'll cover some of those. And it comes with a variety of schools and approaches. It has different um, different paths that you go on. 
on your matha, or going on your way, in order to navigate the Quran and Sunnah to understand what does God want for me right now? How shall I how do I find the Ridha of Allah, the will and pleasure of God, the irada and Ridha of Allah in this moment in this activity? Well, that's what the jurist is doing. It's based upon the sources of Sharia or Sharia as it manifests itself, the way of God, the Quran, the Sunnah. We'll stop here and then we will continue. You guys have a little bit of a break right now. Okay, so that's all set. I see no one's getting up. Okay, I'll get up. I did not think I'm going to warn you.